Sometime in the early 1970s a young Harsh Mariwala joined Bombay Oil Industries a company set up by his grandfather in 1948 just a year after India's independence the company would trade in spices oils and chemicals over the next two decades Harsh learned the ropes of the family business till in 1991 two decades after he had joined Bombay Oil he left to start his own company Marico He had already seen the power of quality and brand in a category that was almost still entirely commoditized and unbranded. For instance, the huge 15-liter cans of parachute coconut oil, Bombay Oil sold to shopkeepers, were then resold in smaller quantities at much higher prices to end customers. Hush rightly wondered why should someone else capture the margin and premium for my product? The company that Hush founded. Marico had two powerful brands at its core: Parachute Coconut Oil and Safola Cooking Oil. That is true even today, 33 years later. Nearly one in three Indians use parachute oil. Our research tells us. Of course, a lot else has changed since then. Marico, which went public just five years after being founded in 1991, today boasts a turnover of over 1.2 billion dollars. And Hush is 72, but still learning exploring experimenting and unable to take it easy earlier this week i had the chance to speak with harsh about his entire and might i add still evolving professional journey it's a long time but harsh talks about the day marico was separated from bombay oil just like it was yesterday he talked about how in 1991 they attracted talent by positioning themselves as the disruptive outsiders sample one of the headlines from marico's ads 200 employees walk out of bombay oil harsh had a lot of stories for me from creating differentiation in consumer products even when the market is crowded to how he fought back and won against the much larger hindustan unilever when it wanted to acquire marico and then he switched back to the present and how he's focusing all of his learnings experience attention into cultivating innovation in india this is an episode packed with anecdotes and lessons you will hear harsh talking about the right to win in a market strategizing acquisitions and making a difference without expectations to the shareholders all in the context of harsh's years at marico the mariwala health initiative asan foundation and marico innovation foundation let's go Welcome to First Principles, Thank Harsh. Thank you. Uh, it's really lovely to have you. I've been looking forward to it for a while. I know we were trying to schedule this uh, for a bit. Your career started almost fifty years ago, mm-hmm. and I mean it's an incredible story, right? You you came out, you started of of the company that your um, family was running. You started Marico, um, and then from that you started Kaya, and you've called Marico your third child. Mm-hmm. in many ways and there are other children we'll come to mm-hmm. later um and marico is of course a listed company guy is a listed company today with the benefit of hindsight we can see that these organizations have become successful but when you were about to start marico did you have a long term vision of what this organization would be or were you essentially trying to target a more medium term niche So I reckon you are asking me this question when I began my career, which was not Marico, which was the Bombay Oil Industry. That's right, which so was your the family owned yeah, business that you had. Yeah. So at that time, I didn't have any clue what I was going to do in life. Zero. I mean, I didn't have any clue. All I knew was that I would not work for anybody else. I would be running my own business. I could never have worked for some other boss. Could I ask you how did you because it sometimes was it something in the family because not a lot of us come to this realization very early on in their career. 
it's basically the way you're brought up that you are in the family business that we have to manage our business it's the entrepreneurial nature yeah, of the family yeah that and when i was young before i joined business also i had, i can't call businesses but i was doing small small things which would earn me some money you know for example sales for different the kind of things at home and all that so i had that that business sense and uh, i and wanted the autonomy to to run my own show rather than working for somebody else but so that i was very clear that i will be in a business but what would i do whether i, I would be doing fmcg or branded goods i didn't have any clue and uh, it evolved over a period of time you know as i went on growing as i went on learning the new business i started getting more and more confident but never thought it will be an fmcg company when after 2 3 4 years we were still looking at creating distribution network uh, building one brand parachute in all india bases safola in big cities so still had a limited vision but as as time passed by and as we got scale then it started coming into my mind that now it can actually become a much bigger opportunity in terms of a branded business and uh, i think that's how i realized that if i had to create an fmcg business it had to be an independent company and cannot be a company which had several businesses cannot be a company which had so many family members because attraction of talent especially in fmcg is much more you create brand out of nothing you create distribution network through people so there is no investment in factory which is as critical as in some other sectors and you have to create products out of nothing through r and d work technology development brands out of nothing you have to start with what should be the brand name to creating trust with the consumer and then you have to those days we had to do all physical distribution we didn't have any e-commerce so it required very good talent and most of the companies which were doing well in fmcg were all mncs so they were they had very good talent and i always thought that we should be able to attract talent from them were they your in some senses the initial inspiration to see that it should be professionally run and therefore not connected to the family and that talent would be important etc i think so because the bigger companies were uh, the likes of hindustan lever and others uh, and of course there were some indian companies but at that time they were not that big there was godre there was dabur before us but they were not as big as and maybe the the processes and the quality of talent at that time in those companies was not at that good so i always looked at the mncs in terms of the the level of competency the talent which they had and you know can we attract some Absolutely. good talent in critical areas absolutely i think the areas. levers and pngs used yes. to be the day one recruiters yes, at absolutely. the iims yeah. back then and absolutely sought after yes. in terms of talent yeah. you launched marico in 1991 yes your i think with the benefit of hindsight it also aligned with india's liberalization journey true when you look back at that time period what do you remember of the so, liberalization phase uh, luckily uh, the sector uh, fmc sector is been quite deregulated from day one and people get surprised when they know that i have hardly been to any government office in my last 50 years for marico's work because it is very deregulated so i have been to government offices when one point of time we had exp- we were exporting coconut oil pack coconut oil from india to bangladesh other markets we had built a sizable business and the coconut oil prices had shot up quite a lot and the government banned the exports so the whole business which we had built a branded business was vulnerable in the sense that we could not supply it from here and i had to go to the government offices and tell them that we are doing it for branded please allow us so to overcome certain uh, negative action taken which was impacting us one had to go to delhi but very very rarely and i think i was very fortunate to be in a business which didn't 
require me to go to Delhi for getting a license, which many of my friends were doing at that time. Because in those days, early 70s and mid 80s and all, I mean, the route to success was to get the right license. So, in a way, when liberalization happened, uh, when delicensing happened, uh, we, I mean, we didn't have a direct benefit. But we always welcome because all of a sudden, you know, it was easier for you to build a business rather than get a license and succeed because you had got a license. We also say that the IT services business down south grew because it was far from Delhi and completely like Possibly, beyond yeah. the radar of yeah, the government. Yeah. But then uh, one other fallout of that was that we, now I'm talking of early 90s, when we, before we began exports. Earlier, the, the reason I talked earlier about going to Delhi was much later when the exports of coconut oil were banned. But that happened in mid 90s. But early 90s, we were getting a lot of orders from Middle East markets and parachute coconut oil was being smuggled from wholesale markets of Bombay to the Middle East market. And then we had to apply for license every time we had we got an export order. So it was quite cumbersome to get a license, fulfill it and then get one more license. And because of the liberalized uh, approach of the government, we were able to allow, the government allowed us to export uh, pack coconut oil uh, without getting license. It was freed, like it was as a policy decision we could export, which was a fallout of the reforms process. Right. You said that when you started Marico, one of the driving forces for you was you wanted to do something on your own and not be answerable to. I get that. But what were either the fault lines or the opportunities that you saw in the existing market that made you do Marico? What opportunities did you see? It was actually a, I don't think it was opportunity backwards expansion. It was a, to some extent we had these two products, you know, Safoda and Parachute when I came in, but nobody was paying any attention to them. So, I used to hear from my uncles, we were supplying a lot of bulk oil to one other company in East India, Shalimar, um, in tankers, and they would pack it in small packs. And um, they had created a big business out of it. So, so the margin I, was going to someone else? Uh, yeah, naturally, because we were supplying in bulk and they were branding it, you know. And the business in bulk has limited margins, you know, and the business was not doing that well erratic in terms of profitability because of very low gross margins. So I was keen to build a business which which was sustainable in terms of growth rates, which was profitable. And uh, because of all these, I mean, nudges from the family, uh, we should do something like that, but nobody was really saying it. I just heard it from the family members. And uh, our quality of oil was very good. So we used to supply oil in big tins, 15 liter tins, and the retailer used to sell it loose. The customer those days would get their own bottle and take loose coconut oil. And they would charge higher for parachute brand in loose form. So there were, we had better quality, and we said that can we actually exploit that by converting the market getting more and more market share. We are doing well in parts of Maharashtra and Gujarat. And then my job was to expand distribution and increase our market share. Got it. But it was a little bit of a, I would say, because we had those products, we did that. It was not something which we did, scanned the opportunity in the marketplace. What should we be doing? Normally, that's the approach in launching a new product. I get that. But, but in those days, it was okay. I already have the capacity. I have the products. Can I convert that business from unbranded to branded? I get that. With yeah. Parachute and with Sofola, that's how you started. Yes. What would you say was the most significant brand bet that you made after them? Where you couldn't no longer look at it as I'm extending something which I already have, merely capturing more of the value chain, but you would have to look at opportunities then. Yes, uh, that happened much later. In first 15-20 years, uh, we saw an opportunity to expand itself in Parachute and Safola. 
and from virtually a 50 lakh base we were able to before Maricos formed we were doing a turnover 80 crores through these two brands on an all India basis and when Maricos formed initially we didn't have that much capital so one had to uh, go a little slow in terms of expansion but then we laid out some sort of a roadmap to increasing our presence in other sectors but we had these two brands and you know many times they say you have to expand beyond a point to other brands like it's like coke you know i don't know what is the percentage of coca cola's revenues to the company but i i reckon it will be in the range of 70 80% you know? this is what they call cash cow brands yeah. which so buying. it's okay to have limited brands uh, but the brands it have to be strong and my target for each brand has always been that can i be market leader in whatever we do so if you ask me today parachute sofola still are the largest brands for for merico but we have many many brands now so we have launched our own brands we have acquired brands uh, we have launched brands like hair and care and then we had acquired brands like setwet livon uh, nihar uh, we had we launched also revive which is a fabric stars brand uh, we have acquired some other brands outside india also so there are now many brands in Maricos stable but still today if you ask me parachute and safola would would form would be the biggest brands their contribution over a period of time has fallen from almost 100% to today must be in the range of about 50 60% so 40% of turnover goes out of other brands so i think we are far more balanced in terms of portfolio products uh, and uh, I think we are very focused in terms of sectors within FMCG which we have gone into. Except for one outlier and revive fabric stars, we are mainly in what we call beauty and wellness. Uh, before I move on from this, I, I want to get a sense of the shifting consumer behavior during the same period. Mm. You've explained how you transitioned mm. from like a family business which was largely in the bulk space to being like in the branded space. And of course, we've discussed liberalization and yeah, that was yeah. playing out along. During this period, what were some of the most significant consumer behavior trends that happened to aid you? So I think the trends which were impacting us and then the overall trend, there are two separate, I would yeah. say. You can answer that question to separate, separate ways, you know. So those days, a lot of loose oil, as I was saying, was being used. The coconut oil... If I had to guess, 90% of coconut oil usage was still in loose and 10% in packed. And because of urbanization, because of wealth increasing rural areas, because of convenience and because of better brand product, uh, that percentage of loose has fallen substantially. There is still some loose usage in smaller towns. But uh, so there's a conversion from unbranded to branded in at least our segment. Number two, if you look at a brand like Safola, there has been, it is always promoted on on the promise of better health or better cholesterol or in those days, we talked about heart health. So the overall awareness for health has increased dramatically and it's likely to increase further. We saw that in COVID itself, the sensitivity to better health and leading a lifestyle which was good lifestyle which would prevent disease. And if you read the, read the right lifestyle, then a lot of today's diseases like uh, cardio issues or overweight or diabetes, I mean, you don't need to battle them because you are taking care of your health. So I think that has been a big change. And with urbanization coming in, I mean, we've gone from nuclear families from family brands. Now, increasingly at least in middle and upper middle classes there are individual brands so each person within a family may have a different brand of toothpaste for example because it's become far more individualized and then issues of customization have come in so okay can you customize your products towards meeting the needs but a lot of these trends you know which have happened in consumers i believe they they're global trends and we saw many trends. I had gone to New York about seven, eight years back and saw trends of both vegan, natural, organic, 
both in in foods as well as in personal products and i think we are seeing that the same thing has come to us in india and far more it will come to india so these are global trends which cut across consumer preferences you know i have a follow up question yeah. on that yeah what might a young harsh today a 20 something harsh look at the consumer market and see as <clears throat> overarching trends that are going to play out over the next 10 20 30 years in which he or she uh might start a new business so i think first of all in the fmcg sector prior to maybe 3 4 years back was perceived as the most defensive sector because if you had to launch a product you needed big money in terms of advertising uh, on in mass media like press television you needed an already a distribution network so you needed a critical mass to appoint distributors and distribute your products across retailers and the retailer base depending on the products can go up to 2 million 3 million outlets so you need a very large field force and for again to bear that cost of field force you need a critical mass so there were entry barriers in marketing and distribution which were preventing newer fmcg players to come in so in a way we all thought that we were very well protected unless until we saw last 2 3 years the emergence of d2c brands so the barriers in distribution got over because you could sell it through marketplaces like amazon uh flipkart and many others you could do digital marketing which did not require budgets of 20 30 crores to launch a product so we have seen the emergence of so many d2c brands and to me that has been a big discontinuity in fmcg space not necessarily what we are doing but overall fmcg so that has been the biggest disruptor and i think uh, to some extent many of the new players have done well i mean one big player which went public was mama earth which started like that and now they also gone into physical distribution so there is a perception that it is there will be a threat to the fmcg business and threat to your own brands now there are two ways of looking at it one is to say that i will have protection led approach to protect my brands against d2c brands another is to say that i will also launch my d2c brands so what we have done in marico is that we have acquired four brands in d2c space uh started with beardo which is male grooming brand then went into just herbs which is for ayurvedic uh, personal care then true elements and of late we have taken a stake in uh, plex which is a nutraceutical brand and on top of that we have our own brands so but these brands require a different mindset to manage they cannot be managed like a traditional fmcg brand uh, could you elaborate what that means so i mean if i had to launch an fmcg a launch budget would be in the range of 25 crores or 30 crores minimum here you can launch something within 50 lakhs one crore also so you don't have the problem of plenty in terms of the resources available you have constrained resources you have limited budget you have to work with the likes of amazon in distributing your products or creating awareness you need to have digital marketing which again requires a different approach so the fmcg mindset and the d2c mindset is very very different and we realized that from day one so we said that if can we create the fmcg business sorry d2c business Uh, by keeping them at a separate location manned by much much younger age talent and their job only will be to to make d2c brands and today our, our turnover in d2c segment itself is about 500 crores and we see it growing so that is one of the biggest shall i say discontinuity in the fmcg sector and then on top of that we see trends like premiumization natural vegan you know so whatever organic i think these are the trends depending on the sector which uh, which you are in uh, you will have to see what kind of trends health comes in immunity comes in you know so more healthy products more and more earlier it was snacks then it came to bake snacks so i think the whole sector is evolving into more value added and premium at one level and at in the rural areas again 
very basic products you know which are value for money when you spun out uh, marico from bombay oil it was very interesting because as part of our research we were looking at some of the newspaper clippings and ads during that time and some of the headlines i'll read them out to you we'll also try and publish mm. it along lata lalita ji mm. boycotts coconut oil mass yes. killer nabbed yes. 200 employees walk yeah. out of bombay oil yes. etc this is a um, campaign which uh, uh, we release when marico was formed and it's very disruptive was, today is, i cannot so imagine the, it being run yeah so i'll <laughs> tell you the the reason behind uh, this is that when we uh, went into marico we wanted to attract good quality talent so the we being a new company we didn't have big budgets we had very very small budgets and uh, the brief given to the ad agency is that we are willing to take some bets we are willing to have disruptive campaigns which can actually with a very small budget can can have an impact in terms of employer branding so we are willing to take risk and that's how this campaign this is a part of one same campaign you know yeah. the, all these three ads came in and with a limited budget we were able to attract attention in the job market we were able to recruit some 40 50 senior people across uh, different functions and i think that really helped us because we were willing to take a risk often they say about advertising is that the kind of advertising that you run attracts the kind of consumer or cohort that's designed to right in this case you were trying to attract talent yes and the first 40 50 people were drawn to you yes because of this fairly i would say provocative line of like for example to say that 200 employees walk out of bombay yes. oil and yeah. join marico yeah. if you had to guess what is it that attracted that initial set of employees to you based on these kind of ads so i think first of all it, it i mean brought an awareness of the company marico you know and then once we got an opportunity to interview them then we could tell them that what we are all about you know and that innovation has played a very important role in our own journey so whether it is new products or anything new which can have an impact we will do it including advertising it could could be anything it could be way of distributing our products so i think that was important and when you have limited resources and high aspirations then you are forced to innovate constraints per innovation yeah, in yeah. the case so of you had to innovate because you know those we just did a campaign with two or three uh, three insertions of each each of these three ads in the newspaper that's all but it when you have they something which ROI. is disruptive then it gets mentioned in the press and it becomes a talking point so there is a lot of rub off effect of that you've talked about the concept of a right to win yeah what does that mean for you so in a highly competitive environment you need to be differentiated and you know disruption can differentiation can happen sorry through innovation or through a pioneering move so if i launch a product today in a market which has many many competitors a me to product i am not offering anything new to the consumer so a strong right to win would mean that it i'm creating some entry barriers from other competitors i am giving something new and i have created that differentiation for me to ensure that the consumer will go on buying the product or whatever i am offering on a regular basis but the right to win has to be protected on a perpetual basis you know you just can't say i have a right to win i'll launch of course i'll get good response but it's a matter of time others will copy so there has to be a continuous process of adding value to your brand by innovations in the product itself by emotional attachment so the right to win has to be kept high not necessarily when you launch a product but for all the times to come because others will copy you and you should always be two steps of ahead of others in terms of ensuring that you are offering something innovative something which the consumer is attached to 
uh, and you maintain that right to win so is is right to win any different from merely continuous innovation innovation continuous Wouldn't innovation is a very important piece of right to win i agree with you but uh, there will be other factors also like emotional attachment you know i like, could I ask you that for yeah. marico for instance what yeah. in your opinion is marico's right continuing or evolving right to win no i'm talking of right to win for a brand now marico's right sure, to win take, would be sure let's take let's take parachute yeah. or safola for instance so safola the right to win is that okay we are the company which is created this market we started off with uh, protecting lowering cholesterol i'm talking early days of safola then from there we went to heart care that is good for heart care and in the process of creating that ecosystem we created an ecosystem of adding value to our customers so we just don't talk about the product per se but what kind of lifestyle should you be living uh, through the brand we are safola healthy art foundation through that we have taken multiple campaigns to educate uh, those who are our users non users about benefits of leading the right lifestyle whether it's exercising or smoking or or the food uh stress we leverage uh, events like the world heart day by offering things like okay uh, free cholesterol checkups and thing like that so when a brand does much more than just sell the product uh and talk about adding value to the consumer the overall attitudinal share of the brand goes up substantially so we have added something which is beyond innovation we have created that halo effect around the brand saying that this brand knows heart care and i have to i can learn from them if you go to our website there is you and you'll do customized diets because each each state in india has a different type of diet i cannot recommend one diet only so the right lifestyle to lead to to lead to a lifestyle which is actually improving your heart health and then from there we went into anything connected to the heart you know so initially it was oils then we launched our oats now which is done well our masala oats again good for heart so whole over a period of time the brand has transited from cholesterol lowering to heart health to anything connected to to heart which is any of the diseases and gone beyond oils to other foods also so, so now we have safola honey we have safola oats oats is a bigger opportunity we have been able to create a market for masala oats uh, from nothing we, there was no market for masala oats and now it's uh, our uh, market share in plain oats also has gone up and we have an oats portfolio of i think range of about 4500 crores now so in some senses what you evolved to is rather than looking at it as a category of oils yeah. you're looking at it as the category of heart health and yes. therefore yeah. like trying to own that as a way of continuous innovation yeah. Yeah. and right yeah. to it i'll switch tracks one of the things you've said um in your earlier interviews is that when when it comes to hiring you like hiring people who are better or smarter than yeah. yourself yeah now a lot of people often say that but it's often very yeah, hard to yeah. kind of truly how do you how do you test for that in your conversations or in your interviews no, first of all i am just a graduate you know <laughs> i am not a postgraduate but smartness has nothing to do with education you no, are but you know so when i started i'm just give you a background when i started working i mean nobody has guided me from the top i have learned everything on my own and uh, of course when you have to learn marketing distribution there has to be some shall i say study of that subject and i whenever i recruited good talent and they were always better than me because i was not i was not an expert in that sub- particular subject i learned much more so that my belief in recruiting good talent better than me went on increasing and it had to be matched by the high degree of empowerment because if i am insecure as a person i will not empower you if you are working for me though you may be better than me in marketing but if i am completely secure and i trust you then i'll empower you and i said the whole organization succeeds may i I'll, i'll also learn a lot from you so i think the starting point is to identify a talent which is better than you so that automatically empowerment will come in it will relieve me of doing many more things which i wanted to do uh, and then 
once you are actually you have i have confidence in you i can empower you so that uh, it it has a better impact on the business of the company also i can draw a line from you saying hire people who are smarter than you yes to empower them yes. in order to make their own decisions to you saying i want to make myself redundant in the organization they are in some senses the continuation yeah. of the yeah. same yeah yeah redundant so that i can do many other things you know hmm. yeah at some stage i i stepped down as managing director but again at some stage i had to do it for the organization sake you know did it come easily because normally for founders the idea of stepping back letting go not being central to the future or continuity of an organization isn't easy to fathom because it's in some senses a part of their self and it's attached to who they are you've talked about mariko for yeah, instance yeah. as your third child yeah, yeah no it didn't come easily because you rightly said i had had built that company to me it was everything i was spending all my time in in running that company so when it came to stepping down i didn't want to be first of all in a situation where on paper i've stepped down but in actual reality i am as back seat driving you know, yeah which is the worst thing to happen then you will need a me too kind of a person who will manage the company who will work with you because on paper that person is there but that will never in effect that will never happen you know so i was very clear that i my role has to change substantially if i am stepping down and i have to select the right person so it was difficult to adjust but i think at some stage realized that the company also needed some new fresh blood number 2 i was also getting along age so needed some succession planning and number 3 the person who came into my uh, shoes also wanted i mean i could have retained him only if i if i offered him that so it's a combination of these two three things and ultimately while doing all this i said that the organization's interest come first because i may have some personal aspirations of continuing till <laughs> much longer but uh, i think we have to look at the organization's interest and many a times you know there are conflicts between the organization's interest and the stakeholder's interest in this case the promoter so but whenever such dilemmas i have faced i've always said that the organization's interest should come first and even if it impacts me negatively at a personal level the organization's interest should always come first and not my personal interest i'm very curious to know who were your sounding boards or mentors or coaches in many of in in i'm sure as you're grappling yeah, with yeah. many of these problems it's impossible to solve them or come out of it with an answer by yourself you yeah. need advice you yes, need yes so who have been your so it's gone on changing over a period of time but you're right absolutely right in the first maybe 20 30 years i relied on individuals rather than consulting firms like mckinsey's or something i used to go identify individuals who could help me in the initial stages they were or helping me in the area of domain knowledge experts like marketing I used to go to a professor in iim ahmedabad uh, go there he would not have time so i would go in the evening flight stay the whole night and come back in the morning for hr i had a friend who i used to know working with him and see so in the first 4 5 years more making me understand the business and then as all that happened they needed people in terms of organization culture building strategy and thing like that so work with many but if i had to name some of the leading names which uh, one is professor ramcharan who was co-author with me in my book harsh realities uh, i work with jagdish shet uh, interact a lot with uh, professor ck pralad so these were mainly indians who had settled abroad then raj si sodia who has also written book firms of endearment was it because of the distance you said indians who settled abroad did that give them enough distance yeah, no they would to... come here you know most no i meant them, like distance from not necessarily no because they were really top class uh, in in their own field and they were better than options available within india i mean there were options of indians within india but these were international uh, names you know so they were at a far higher uh, level of competency and they were able to i think guide me much better because they had global kind of uh, uh, clients and thing like that so worked yeah. with many many over a period of time uh, but one has to be clear you know i think many entrepreneurs are not clear when they are looking for a i want a consultant but what do you want to consult be very very specific 
and then you know normally it's important to write down on a sheet of paper what do you expect out of the consulting assignment and share with them i normally prototype on a small scale let's try and work on a small problem it's as much for me to judge the consultant the judge or the consultant also should be able to judge me in terms of are they happy working with me so and then scale it up over a period of time were there people individuals within the organization or your family who had the ability to say no or counter your views how because- many times yeah especially in the family level you know because it's a large family hmm. i was the person from the next generation the eldest person and then my father was the eldest three is brother so many changes we want to bring in about naturally because of older generation there is some resistance because either cost or something so one had to face those issues many many times you know the other issue is down the line you know and when you work with an consultant you know you don't want to i have always involved the team for example if i want to uh, improve my strategy formulation then it's just not me working with a strategy consultant so me and the team evaluating the options available so there is enough buy in from the team also because if i appoint somebody else and if there is no buy in from the team then it will just never get transferred so involve the team also in making a decision so that they will ultimately they will work with that consultant with their own heart in it that okay i want something out of it what would be your advice for younger founders and entrepreneurs in order to be able to kind to cultivate or create a set of people who could act as their either sounding boards yeah. or mentors because reaching to a stage where you can afford True. consultants True. or consulting yeah. companies yeah. comes yeah. much later True. many of these decisions you talked about yes. what is my role when should i let yeah. go etc yeah. these are intensely personal discussions i would feel yes. what would be your advice for younger entrepreneurs so i think first of all you have to be clear what you want and some critical issues you're not been able to resolve or you think by going to somebody else you'll be able to get a better guidance you just identify what is the problem and then scan what is available depending on how much you can afford because some of the consultants today can charge $40000 a day also you a small startup may not be able to afford so be very clear what you want and then what can you afford and you can find options you know which will give you if not the best advice at least something better than what you're doing and then identify some individual through your own networks meet them check their references and do homework and while doing that involve the team also so that there is a strong buy in and then prototype it in small projects and then scale it up over a period of time but there will be individuals who you can get uh, but you should be clear what you want them for i want to talk about careers mm. given that you've had such a long and illustrious career i feel that the view towards professional work and careers has been changing quite fast over the last maybe 10 years or so i mean earlier generations like the concept of work was somewhere where you could work in an organization for 10 years 20 mm-hmm. years mm-hmm. the organization was your family you gave it a lot of this thing <laughs> is giving way to work is seen largely as something that brings in money yeah. the objective is can i retire at 40 or 45 and i'm yeah. i'm sure this is news to you right yeah. so the the way you look at a career yeah. or professional life is in some ways becoming more transactional and i think covid yes. has only yeah. accelerated it yeah. what would be your advice to younger folks today when it comes to looking at the next 20 30 40 50 years of their careers and professional lives how should they think about careers so i think there is a certain myth that you know i am burning out i am working hard i just want to take it easy you know it's at a very young age you know you have to be occupied mentally even at today also i have to be working full time you know i can't sit at home and do nothing there is limited amount of inter- fun i like by going for vacation but we want a point you have to keep your mind on so i think my advice to those who are looking at building you have to keep yourself mentally alert and active and whatever is required if you think that certain job you have you are not enjoying go to some other job go to some other skill but your mental occupation and your ability to give something and contribute is has to be very high uh, it depends on the individual i mean if you are tired of marketing for example you want to go to something else that's a different thing as long as it is based on your strengths you know because 
don't do something which is you're doing because it is the in thing to do don't go to it because 20 other people are going to it and you don't know anything about it you know so you leverage your strengths identify your strengths leverage your strengths and if you think that you need to have a new challenge um you can prototype that try it out but i think the end thing is you have to be occupied yourself until <laughs> i would say until 75 80 years 80 years <laughs> but even if not at least you can't retire at the age of 40 that's for sure great i'm sure people would have tried to give you advice saying that you're 72 shouldn't you be retiring now you've built and created more than what you possibly thought you could so what's have they and what's been your answer to them so you know i spend a lot of time in doing many things you know on the business itself i don't spend more than 20 30% of my time so i am i know what exactly is happening in the business uh, but i don't have any control orientation so hands off mind on 25 by 7 24 by 7 you know so mind is always on okay what can i have seen something can i can we do this i'll discuss with the team or any other thought i have you know and then i do a lot of other things you know my whole today i am i am involved in many other philanthropic activities from my own marico innovation foundation reports to me i am on board of many companies so i am using my my experience to give something back to make a difference to others you know so wherever i i do a lot of mentoring i do about 8 10 mentoring sessions a month you know but the whole objective is to i am not expecting anything in return it is just that i am able to add value to those entrepreneurs uh, what's your typical working day like in terms it, of hours it goes on changing but number of hours it is like you know, take a little easy 10 to 435 you know but then i if there is work i do it at home you know finish it off so so that's my question yeah. so what's keeping you going i don't know i have to be occupied you know otherwise i'll go mad i have to be occupied i have to do something and uh, mentally occupied have you seen the shift in how people think about intellectual occupation and capacity between the generations from your generation to younger generations etc even at marico or others since you work with so many younger startups as well that the attitudes towards what is a productive life or what is work like i'll i'll go back to something that you said earlier which i strongly believe in which is don't merely try to run away from work which you're not enjoying yeah Yeah. and say that i don't enjoy work instead try to find what is it that you enjoy and works yeah. to your strengths correct often that's the other side of the coin which people yeah. miss and they only yeah. look at the first side yeah so i think you're right you have you have to reinvent yourself based on your strengths and based on your passions and need to create do something which will make a difference to others and enjoy that journey also you know because if i'm able to help others it is beyond a point money doesn't attract uh, it doesn't matter at all but if i'm able to make an impact and i see that visible impact on their business that satisfaction it gives is much more do you remember when you sort of cross door at marico from okay i built this organization and it's gotten to a certain stage and scale and now i'm ready to do other things whether they be philanthropy ecosystems innovation etc when did that happen no so i mean some of the seeds of all this were sown before i stepped down but a lot more initiatives happened after i stepped down because then you have enough time to think and visualize so it's a chicken and, and egg till you step back yeah, it doesn't allow to some you extent to. but you broadly know that you know these are your strengths and you want to do like in the area of philanthropy i was very clear that i am not the kind of person who donates money to hospital or a school and i am going to do active giving when i say active giving that means if i spend money i'll more than money i'll spend my personal time and energy to that particular cause that means that cause i should be good at that cause and i should be passionate about it so i chose consciously causes which i was good at and supported initiatives in that particular field through different organizations i'm involved in. where did that come because philanthropy is very important for you you set up multiple foundations uh you work in various areas so philanthropy is not something which is peripheral to you it's very central to mm. what you operate where did it come about from and by the way this definition that you give that 
it's not passive philanthropy where it's just about giving but it's yeah. active philanthropy i need to be good at it yeah that's a different kind of bar right where did that come from where did <laughs> philanthropy enter your uh, horizon and this active philanthropy what if you are to look at it like you know where is it coming from i don't remember what where it has come from maybe i read a lot so i may have got some ideas from somebody something i have read but also believe that many a times you know when you donate money to hospital you know if you read the right lifestyle you know a lot of hospital stays can be avoided you know so tackle the root cause what is gone wrong with your lifestyle whether it is eating or high blood pressure or obesity or diabetic or whatever cardio issues if you lead the right lifestyle you don't need to go to the hospital at all that's also a consumer shift from healthcare to wellness yeah yes stay healthy instead yes. of trying to address yeah. it once you're no longer Correct. healthy yeah so i don't know where it has come from but it's something which i always thought that i should i should be a part and parcel of then other thing which while identifying those causes was that i had to pioneer something which nobody else has done so even if i look at my own businesses or the brands we created in whatever we do we are the market leader so i want to be a thought leader in whatever we do so when it came to selecting the causes you know we have in marico i started marico innovation foundation much much be- before all the csr rules came in we started 20 21 years back you know then we i have personally created ascent which is our our philanthropic initiative to help entrepreneurs learn from each other and scale up you know and the third is mental health which is marivala health initiative in all these three things i realized there was a there was a vacant gap in terms of nobody was occupying that that leadership kind of our opportunity you know so mental health we identified about 10 8, 8 years back that time mental health was not very high on the radar but after covid and all mental health has become far more so we are now leading organization in india in the area of mental health we support some like 50 organizations by making grants and helping them and we do a lot of work in the area of mental health in terms of how, how did mental health uh, i'm passionate important. about health so then within health we are doing a lot of work i talked earlier about safola and right lifestyle you know mental health was not covered and then based on my interactions uh, was able to identify that this is one area where there is there is a gap there so there is strong overlap between your own interests yes. and where they drive you yes. and a lot of these areas that like for yes. instance yesterday when i was researching one of the things that came out is aqua therapy yes did yes. that also come up it from your because own because of my belief in health you know that uh, and i'll tell you whether it's aqua therapy or skin care through kaya no so i'm health i'm very passionate about so many a times this just happens out of coincidences you know so somebody came to me my physiotherapist saying that uh, there are no aqua pools in in india or there is an opportunity to create something and these are these are so i'll tell you so, so yeah. i went abroad with him to europe usa and these are centers where you can actually uh, go into the pools it's heated water so it's very comfortable in respect to the weather and we have uh, trained staff and we have created four different verticals you know one is uh, physio any physio issues second is women's health third is neuro which is true with stroke and and third is uh, children's orthopedic no, sorry not orth- pediatric so any person is very easy to exercise in water your weight is 1/10th in water compared to land and for good recovery the muscles have to be exercised so when a partly paralyzed person is put in the water through a hoist and made to exercise i find it much easier to exercise in water that leads to faster recovery and we've seen some amazing results of recovery in all these four verticals through our initiative in aqua it's not done for a business because it's today we have one one center in bombay we are establishing one more center in bombay but is more done out of my passion that okay if i'm able to make an impact on people's health their recovery no, I and I, yeah. i've i've done i remember yeah. trying to run in slow motion through a pool yes. when i was recovering my yes. uh, damaged ankle yeah, yeah, and yeah. so so i completely get it sticking with marico innovation foundation 
it's a very interesting organization you started it many years ago you're trying to, as i understand <coughs> it the if i reduce its objective um to very simple forms and please correct me if i'm wrong you're trying to find young entrepreneurs founders startups which are roughly let's say in the 50 lakh 1 crore 2 crore range of revenue and work with them and support them to scale up rapidly by yeah. connecting them to an yeah. ecosystem and take them to the 100 crore mark yeah and you've been doing this for years mm. and this is a non profit foundation yeah it looks to me this is a venture capital firm doing a non profits work yeah is so it it why are you doing this and how does this make sense you said that there was nobody else doing this to which i would say yes because most of the companies doing this would be doing this with a profit motive yeah. like a venture capital i find a startup yeah i help it grow yeah i make money in the process yeah. Yeah. you're obviously doing something which few others will do why yes it comes from belief that innovation is very critical in india we started this 20 years back and innovation was not on top of the agenda of all the ceo any ceo you would ask innovation is not on top of it today if you ask innovation is on top of agenda and we realized this because my early success in the business was attributed to innovations you know and we said that if it has huge impact on merico why can't we fuel innovation in india both in business as well as in non business areas so with that in mind we have started commission studies on improving what was happening in the innovation innovative organizations we have innovation awards and one of the initiatives we realized was that many organizations both in profit and non profit were having very good ideas innovative ideas but they didn't know how to scale up so with that insight we started working and now we work with at a time over thing about 18 or 20 organizations we take up their innovation challenge i get involved personally we also involve mariko's talent pool depending on the kind of challenge which they are facing so they spend time with the organization we also have identified some retired ceos they we rope them in some of the critical innovation challenges we put it up to all the management schools as a part of the summer training project and we have three management schools uh, take three projects so the whole objective is to help them scale up you know because if there those innovative organizations are scaling up it can have a big impact on them as well as the overall ecosystem and overall innovation flourish but we don't expect anything out of it you yeah, know that, because that's I'm I'm sorry to interrupt you yeah. but that's where I'm trying to understand yeah. because I can easily imagine when you started and as you're running this foundation and let's let's take a parallel yeah. universe yeah. right all of this is done but a company says that hey we are doing this we are able to identify and get access to promising startups early yeah. and we are giving our time and attention and yeah. energies to help them grow we should take equity in return for it and in the process they will win we will win it's a quote unquote win win yeah. situation but you didn't we do didn't, that we don't want to do it also i'm very clear because it become very contractual here we want to give something back and you know money beyond a point is not going to take marico to a greater height you know for this it will be too small for marico and i think we want to create that equity that goodwill that we are doing something pro bono and it is helping them and to me this is csr you know if you're doing csr to improve education you doing csr to for rural development this also is a csr of helping innovative organizations scale up you know what do you mean by building an organization for perpetuity <laughs> so it means that the organization should continue beyond me so today i am of a certain age tomorrow something happens to me the organization should continue on its own steam and uh, today in the fmcg sector there are many organizations which have continued for more than 100 200 300 years like levers or procter and gamble l'oreal they are much older organizations so as a as as a sector we are far more protected sector we are far more defensive sector there are many entry barriers except this d2c uh, thing which i talked about but in spite of that uh, we believe that if we have strong brands and if we are able to maintain those brands we can build an organization for perpetuity so what is required for an organization to to run on a perpetual basis i think the first of all 
you need to have a purpose in the organization. What is the organization's purpose? In our case, the purpose is to make a difference to others, to all our stakeholders. And that's where what I was telling you about earlier about Innovation Foundation, it comes in. We want to make a difference without expectation. So if it is our packaging vendor, can I help him improve productivity? We have to go two steps ahead of treating them as an associate, you know. So that you need to have a strong purpose. Number two, there has to be clear strategy that what is the organization doing, what is my business and what it should be. And that strategy can go on changing over a few years. It need not be static, you know. But there has to be strategy. And then what are the values of the organization? What is the culture of the organization? What culture is required for you to succeed in that strategy? Because culture and strategy are deeply interlinked. So I think you need those necessary building blocks. And then I think there will be certain, uh, in, in companies, it will be a board of directors who will be monitoring this. So what is the quality of talent? Who is managing the company? And is the company living the purpose, the strategy, and the culture of the organization? And of course, delivering results, which will ensure that it continues on a perpetual basis. Is there a time when you would advise founders to start thinking of their organizations as perpetual organizations? Even though the concept of a corporation itself is it's a going concern, but yet startups are often seen yeah. as, are you building yeah. for an exit? Yeah. In, in so that I sense... It all depends on the mindset of the entrepreneur. No, I, my mindset is not to sell. Okay, that is my mindset. But that doesn't mean that's the right mind. And maybe in the kind of business... But are, even if okay. you were to sell, wouldn't it be better to not build an organization to sell? Because they say that, you know, organizations that are not looking to sell are the ones that most people want to acquire. That whether I don't know about that. But I'm just saying that I am not a kind of person who wants to sell and then what make money and then you know that that mindset is not there but there are many entrepreneurs who are serial entrepreneurs who will build a business sell start something else sell so but that's their mindset you know so you have to be clear what is your mindset and maybe depending on the kind of business you are you know so maybe there are some businesses which are very very discontinuous you know they get impacted a lot by the outside environment and technologies and very disruptive environments so in that case to build a perpetual business itself may be very, very difficult because the life cycle of that particular business in that sector is... There's no is, continuing right yeah, to win. Yeah, correct. It may be difficult. 